Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever the time is where you're uh, tuning in, live from Kangaroo Island. Uh, this week we're doing something which was, uh, I would say, almost impossible to do live uh, in terms of us going out and finding an echidna. Um, so the short beaked echidna is the focus of our um, live cross this week. And Kangaroo is a really important location for this species and we encounter them probably one average through the year out touring uh, with our touring program we'd encounter them one every other day I guess but when conditions are right you'll see them more and if it's if it's hot and very dry you'll see them less they'll sort of switch to being nocturnal and um, but uh, rather than looking at me let's have a look at the echidna and uh, and I'll explain both the circumstances of, of us coming across it yesterday and then a little bit about the really interesting behaviour and ecology of uh, what is one of the most unusual and interesting uh, creatures we have in our backyard here on Kangaroo Island. So for all the wildlife encounters we have on Kangaroo Island, echidnas are probably the most unpredictable in terms of behaviour. There's a really, really broad range of behaviours in terms of their response to us coming across them. They can either be, particularly if they're younger, completely ignorant of us and just keep on going about their business and wandering through the bush. And uh, you know, they might we might be in the way, so I've, I've had them come up and really try and bulldoze my foot out the way because it's uh, I'm obviously in the in the wrong spot. Uh, we've had people's camera gear turned upside down as they've burrowed in underneath and tipped it upside down. And we've also had ones which are like this little guy here that uh, Janet came across yesterday up on Duck Lagoon Road as we uh, she was going for a bit of a wander and uh, called us up and uh, so we went up and uh, tried to film it. And I have to say they are very, very patient creatures. We sat, you can see a little nose just poking up there. This little guy is very, very shy, very, very uh, um, timid, and I guess that makes a good survivor. You know, when you're covered with a, uh, a just an amazing carpet of sharp, hard spines, as you can see here, then uh, digging in like this and you know, finding some cover underneath some. Uh, leaf litter and some sticks uh, it provides you with some uh, some amazing defense anyway i let, literally sat for uh, a combined two hours uh, to get the uh, the footage which we're going to share now and interestingly what really changed and uh, stimulated this little girl or guy we don't know and i'll talk about that in a minute uh, to to really become more animated and uh, and more relaxed was a combination of me being totally silent, did not move a muscle, just stood behind the uh, the camera. I'm shooting with a 600 millimeter lens uh, zoomed in on a tripod at some distance here at this point. And uh, what changed the behavior was it started raining. So uh, that really created uh, a bit more um, animation and um, in terms of the animal, echidnas are one of only two egg-laying mammals in the world. There's actually two echidnas. There's the short-beaked echidna of Australia and then the long-beaked echidna, which is a much larger animal, probably double to treble the body weight found in New Guinea. The other one, of course, as far as egg-laying mammals, is far better known, which is the the platypus or duck-billed platypus. So they're mammals, but they lay eggs. They nurse their young, but they don't have nipples. They've got hair, but a lot of the hair is uh, modified as spine. So they're just a little bit different. They are quite solitary animals. So, but for the winter time, or largely winter time, which is the mating time, they are almost always just one animal wandering along and, and usually foraging. Uh, one of the other names other than short-beaked echidna 
is the spiny anteater. Now they're not an anteater, an anteater, the true anteater is a regular placental mammal like people are, whereas uh, these guys, as I said, they're, they're egg-laying mammals or monotremes. Monotremes means one whole, they have a common reproductive and waste vent, um, which is the same for both males and females. Uh, pretty hard for uh, anyone just observing the animals to determine whether it's a male or a female. Uh, the world expert on this species is Dr. Peggy Rismiller, who happens to live here on Kangaroo Island, and I have to thank her for much of the information that we um, are able to share about this species. And um, she is able to, when she's got an animal in the hand, because she's been observing these animals in the bush for a very, very long time, probably 30 years now, um, she's able to determine uh, gender through uh, palpating the uh, um, on the belly of them. But uh, for for us, when we're um, out observing them as uh, part of the uh, the wildlife mix in our, our touring program, um, we've got no idea whether we're looking at males or females, unless we have we very very lucky and come across what's known as a mating train a mating train that is one female and she obviously has a pretty strong perfume there's a pheromone which uh, is released um, when she is receptive for mating and then a very polite cue of males will form and when I say a cue it might be two three four there's even been up to mating trains of 11 seen. So one female up the front and all the rest of the boys following along. So really, really uh, unusual in terms of their... Uh, um, oh, this is where uh, a car has just gone by and uh, I think we've got a tongue coming out. There you go. Now that long sticky tongue is where the name comes from for the scientific name. So Tachyglossus is the genus, Tachyglossus. There's another slow-mo of that long, long tongue coming out, which uh, is used very rapidly when they're getting into termites or ants, which uh, make up um, much, but not all of its uh, diet. Um, so the name Tachyglossus, Tachy is fast, like if you have a uh, heart, heartbeat that's fast, Tachycardia, same thing, or a... Um, your taco for your car, working out how fast the engine's going. So tacky glosses, fast tongue, and then aculeatus, which means spiny. And the kangaroo island shortbeak echidna, as the name suggests, is a kangaroo island subspecies. It's a special only found on kangaroo island. And our spe specific uh, echidna is their specific name is multi aculeatus. So. Fast tongue, spiny, very spiny is what the uh, scientific name comes out at. And um, the going back to the uh, the reproduction of uh, these unusual creatures, the female will mate with the last remaining male, and that might be days after this train has been, uh, you know, zooming around the countryside, slowly, slowly mo losing. Uh, uh, carriages off the back as they get bored and, and off they go and it's just the, the most persistent male that uh, then mates and um, they will then, the female after a relatively short time of development uh, she will lay a leathery egg which is a tiny tiny little egg and lay it into a pouch. Now Aussies know a lot about pouches because of all of our marsupials. Marsupial pouches, like a kangaroo or a possum or a koala or a wombat, they are permanent pockets. Whereas for the echidna, both males and females would have the ability with their um, abdominal muscles, their belly muscles, they can actually pull together the muscles to make a, a temporary pouch. And uh, so the pouch is not an indication of gender, Again, one of those other funny little things about this creature. And th so she'll lay the egg straight into the pouch. Um, after 10 to 11 days, it hatched the little tiny um, echidna at a very, very premature 
in terms of development um, stage, um, it's laid and it weighs 300 milligrams. That is 0 0.01 of an ounce. So it weighs pretty much nothing. And at that size, there's a fair bit of evidence that they're actually respiring through their skin because uh, you know, they're tiny and their, uh, their lungs are yet to be developed. So really, really interesting. And um, I mentioned before their marsupials, placentals, and monotremes all nurse with milk, but the monotremes don't have nipples. So they have a patch of modified hair on their belly. This is the, the milk patch, and that will exude milk that the little one lap up with that long tongue. And this, this one now, I've, I've been quiet for a very, very long time here with the camera, and it's starting to uh, um, have a little bit of a fossic around and grab some some uh, food and you may be able to hear now it's starting to rain so uh, your light rain falling and I've not seen this behavior before but um, I wish I could see on the other side of what's going on here but I suspect that uh, he or she is grooming and it's just about completely rolling on its back and um, and it may actually be um, with the tongue maybe uh, lapping up some some water it looks as though the head's moving back and forth there rhythmically it might be uh, the tongue moving so um, yeah that was, uh, it was I was really excited to see this and really pleased to be able to share this with you because it's a it's a rare insight into these uh, these creatures so we normally either see them just going to ground or out fossicking or just you know or busy feeding whereas uh, yeah this you know grooming and uh, you know, possibly at the same time having a drink um, is uh, rarely seen and now you can see that really really broad pad there with the uh, that's a that's the front left uh, hand up in the air and uh, you can see five very long very strong claws um, and that's what they use for digging unusually echidnas have front feet that face forwards and that's like most four-legged animals but their back feet face backwards so that's really really a uh, uh, provides them with extraordinary ability just to disappear with a vertical dig and they can go straight down so really really strong very short limbs very uh, strong leverage the way they're uh, there's that tongue going out again um, and you can see the little nostrils there just where the tongue came out of and a little bit the nostrils are a little bit darker uh, because they are wet so they're um, they have a lot of saliva and um, you'd imagine putting your if your job for feeding involves putting your nose into the uh, into the dirt you'd imagine it filling up with sand and with dirt and whatever so they you often hear them snorting and uh, and even you'll see them blowing bubbles with uh, a bit of mucus coming out of their nose to uh, clear their nose whilst they get back on with the uh, important job of feeding and um, the just continuing on with the uh, the reproduction because it really is unusual the the little one will nurse from these modified hairs it's almost like seeing sweat coming out of pores and it, it may well be a very similar thing evolutionary in terms of you know, where the where um, you know, nipples actually came from so they nurse the little one and uh, carry it around in the pouch. When the little guy gets too, or little girl gets too big, um, they actually get, mum will go and dig a nursery burrow. And uh, she'll go and put it in the burrow and then give it a last feed. It's having a bit of a scratch here and that long tongue coming out again. Um, just also sorry just i missed that there was a you can see a long claw just at the back right there their outermost toe on both front and rear legs is a extended um, claw which they uh are long enough to get in between those spines so starting to have a bit of a uh, bit of a dig here um and that's actually diagnostic in terms of the um of, of the subspecies the tasmanian uh, echidna is not only much much furrier than uh, these ones it's having a groom now with that grooming claw um, but also has a double grooming claw on each side and um, we've now just switched um, camera position here a little bit 
and it's up having a bit of a look around. That grooming claw is very obvious there on the uh, back right, as is a fairly um, um, long tail for an animal that at first glance doesn't have much of a tail. You can see that last little, uh, probably, you know, 10% of the animal there that's sticking towards us is um, is their tail. So when the mum puts the little one back in the pouch, uh, back in the uh, the burrow, sorry, she'll feed it and then fill up the pouch, lock the uh, little one in and go out foraging and might be gone for six or seven days. So the little ones will, they will nurse and nurse and nurse, having a bit of a scratch there with that grooming claw um, and then have to get by with whatever's in the belly and the temperature of the of the um, burrow is ambient ground temperature here which is about 16 degrees 15 16 degrees celsius so uh, yeah that's around 60 degrees so in terms of their body regulation you can see them uh, start this one is having a bit of a d here now um, they're far more like a reptile than they are like a mammal, so their body temperature A is lower and varies a whole lot more than what you'd expect. Uh, not so much on kangaroo Island because we don't get super cold winters, but up in alpine areas in Australia, echidna's body temperatures during a, a torpor, which is like a, 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 akin to a hibernation, they'll drop down, body temperature will drop down to four degrees Celsius. That's 40 degrees Fahrenheit, which is just amazing. And they'll go into that torpor. Now, you're probably aware that Australia has experienced you know, massive bushfires through our last summer. And uh, people were often concerned about the impact of the fires on our wildlife species. Echidnas are really, really adapted to fire. And that digging I mentioned where they can dig straight down, they uh, are able to just dig down when the fire comes, their metabolism drops, so heart rate, breathing rate, and they go into this torpor, the fire passes and they'll come back out again and off they go again. So. They've been around literally, there's been, you know, there's ancestral forms of these guys 120 million years ago. So, you know, they literally walk with dinosaurs. So that's, that's really where, um, you know, that, those skills, the uh, adaptation, the flexibility of the animal in terms of, uh, you know, broad diet of lots of different insects. Um, they can vary their body weight depending on season um, over a much broader range than what would be healthy for you and I. So uh, I, I haven't finished off with the, the little one back in the burrow. Um, effectively, mum will feed her every seven days and then eventually mum just does not come back. The little one has to dig its way out and off it goes um, exploring on its own. So um, everything they learn or everything they know is either hardwired or just trial and error when they get out there into the uh, into the bush. Um, the other thing on fire is the, uh, if you've got lots of echidnas around, you've got lots of bare ground because they just dig everything up. They provide amazing ash bed for, uh, sorry, um, seed beds for uh, germinating plants. And uh, they actually, you know, would slow the, lots of echidna diggings in the ground would actually slow the passage of a, of a fire through the undergrowth with um, slow, with a nice light fire, so uh, yeah, healthy environments, uh, you know, different uh, different fire regimes. Um, in terms of where they fit in the uh, ecologically, in terms of niche, if you if you're from New Zealand or you've travelled New Zealand, you're aware of the, uh, the uh, bird kiwi. Kiwis and echidnas effectively play the same role. So long beak and it is a beak um, so that's a, a yeah where the bony structure of the nose is attached to the um, as part of the skull um, and probing into the uh, into the, their deep leaf litter in, in order to find their food um, in terms of the uh, the intelligence of, a, of echidnas um, they they've got we know from the work that uh, Peggy Rismill has done at Pelican Lagoon that they've got 
excellent spatial knowledge. They use the same space, uh, same areas um, very regularly. And um, our neocortex, which is the part of our brain, higher, higher mammals, typically that's around 30% um, on the, uh, the so-called higher mammals. Um, humans, it's 76% of, of, our, of our brain weight. And um, echidnas actually fit in, sit in the middle there at about 43%. So they've got a much, much higher, um, much larger neocortex. And that's the part of our brain which is associated with, with reasoning and with personality. And so, yeah, we've got good reason to uh, you know, really support the fact that these are, um, you know, pretty good, uh, good thinkers and, uh, and they're very aware of their environment, which is uh, certainly you know, shown the case here. And we've just flipped back now to the start, so the animal uh, is, uh, this is, it's still reacting to me relatively early in the time that, um, that I was there filming. Um, one of the interesting things about the echidna's spines is that most other spiny animals, if you think um, porcupine or hedgehog, their, their spines are just in the top level of their, uh, of their skin, so when they, uh, you know, if, if they were to shake, um, yeah, this, their spines would move fairly freely. Um, whereas with the echidnas, the base of the spines are actually embedded in muscle tissue. Um, and uh, Peggy, who's uh, a environmental physiologist, so she does all of her work in the field rather than with captive animals, she's very much of the, uh, of the mind that the the fact that the spines A are hollow and B are embedded in muscle tissue is perhaps something to do with thermoregulation rather than about having a big spiny defence against some previous predator because there's certainly no predator on Kangaroo Island today that could take uh, take on an adult echidna. We, we do have goannas and feral cats that can take the, uh, the little ones if they find them in the um, in the nursery burrows, but uh, in terms of adults, they they can't be uh, can't really be taken out from that. And um, I'm just going to finish up now with just a little bit of a discussion around the the experience that um, we're able to offer, courtesy of Peggy here on Kangaroo Island. So, as part of the uh, exceptional Kangaroo Island um, touring offer, one of the experiences which we can do is get Peggy to come along and join us for lunch and do a bit of a lecture and also then go for a bit of a bushwalk and, um, and learn about literally a day in the life of a wildlife researcher from one of the world experts for the species. So that's a great thing to do for families if you want to have an educational component to, to your visit. Peggy's really, really a warm and engaging educator. She's uh, she's lots of fun, and uh, by doing so, we're actually supporting the work that she's been doing for now 30 years on on Kangaroo Island. And her, I guess, uh, Peggy's task. Um, she always says that um, you know the echidnas were known to the Western world. Obviously, Indigenous people have known about echidnas for forever, and um, and have a, a, a great understanding of them. But as far as from the Western perspective. They really weren't known until uh, relatively recently. And then in, and in 1865, uh, Sir Richard Owen, who was the founder of the British Natural History Museum, he posed a series of questions um, in relation to monotremes because they're only found in Australia and uh, Australia and New Zealand, and um, sorry, New Guinea. And um, there's a lot that we didn't know in 1865. How do they mate, the length of gestation, how are the little ones nourished, um, the size and condition of the young at birth, how long do they suckle, the age of sexual maturity, when do they mate, and how often do they reproduce. So those eight questions, Peggy is slowly working her way through that. So a lot of the things that, I, that I've been able to share with you today um, come because we've had somebody doing radio tracking and lots of the very, very patient uh, work out in the field. Anyway, we're going to wind up at, at that uh, now. So uh, thanks very much for tuning in. If you have any questions, just pop them in the, uh, um, just down the bottom there with the, uh, the Facebook. And um, I'm just having a bit of a, a look. I've got lots of friends tuning in. Hey there, Janet, Ruben, Barbara, and 
yeah, we've had some guests who have uh, seen them in the wild, having visited them. And um, yeah, so please uh, yeah, continue to, to uh, you know, engage with us and, and ask any questions you might have about the wildlife on the island or visiting the island and, and you know, come back and see us soon. Hope everyone's staying safe and uh, things are starting to sort of free up here and uh, you know, we're really looking forward to getting back into um, sharing rather than doing it virtually, doing it uh, in reality and, and looking after people exploring Kangaroo Island. This is live from Kangaroo Island. See you next time.